IEP is provided to the students' parents and to all teachers and service providers to ensure that they that all have an in-depth understanding of the student and their educational needs and characteristics. We develop programs of special education and related services that are customized to each student's individual needs and characteristics as determined through the evaluation process and never solely on a student's disability classification. This school year, there are 20,450 students with the IEP classification of autism in New York City, 17,015 of whom are being served in Department, in department ed of Education or charter schools. For a second straight school year, we have seen a 20% increase in the number of students with autism receiving services in district school settings. These students receive, receive um, these students receive individualized supports and services, including around 3,000 children who receive specialized ins instruction along their typically developing peers in the general education settings. Included in, in the student population are over 1,000 children who are served in our ASD NEST program. The ASD NEST program was developed in collaboration with New York University's ASD NEST support project. The program serves students with ASD alongside typically developing peers in a reduced sized, in a reduced class size integrated co-teaching class with one special education teacher and one general education teacher. Staff receive training in specialized teaching strategies for students with ASD, including social development intervention, a program developed by NYU that uses evidence-based practices to support the social and emotional development of students with autism. Our district schools also serve nearly 450 students in our ASD Horizon program. The ASD Horizon program was developed by the Department of Education in collaboration with the New England Center for Children, also known as NEC. This program serves a maximum of eight students in a, in, with ASD in a special class with one special education teacher and one paraprofessional. As students develop necessary academic and social skills, opportunities for inclusion with typically developing peers are, are encouraged. ASD Horizon program staff are trained in specialized teaching strategies for students with ASD, including the Autism Curricula, Curriculum Encyclopedia developed by NEC. The Autism Curriculum Encyclopedia is an evidence-based program based on applied behavioral analysis, which supports the academic and social and emotional development of students with ASD. The growth of ASD and Her A Horizon and ASD NEST programs each year is indicative of this administration's unwavering commitment to meeting the specialized needs of students with ASD in the city. Students with autism who have more intensive needs in academic, uh, in academic, social, or physical development and or management are usually served in specific class settings in the Department of Education's District 75, a citywide network of specialized schools. Here, students acquire language and social skills um, supported by speech and language therapy and speech and, uh, and language and other therapists as well as by augmentative and alternative communication support. Classes have one special education teacher and one or more paraprofessionals. Many District 75 programs also offer opportunities for inclusion through strong partnerships with their co-located district schools. This year, District 75 programs are serving nearly 11,000 students on the spectrum. The DOE also serves roughly 3,500 students with ASD who attend non-public schools. This includes students who attend private or religious schools and receive special education and or related services through the Department of Education and students who have IEPs that recommend specialized private schools approved by the New York State Department of Education to serve students whose needs are more intensive than can be addressed in the public school setting. We remain committed to serving and supporting families of students with a disability before, during, and after their child's school age journey. Examples of these supports include parent counseling and training for families uh, with student, of students with autism, partnership with the citywide councils, uh, uh, the citywide education councils, including regular participation at their meetings, co-facilitation of parent tra trainings with advocacy groups and other community-based organizations, and ongoing support provided at the local level via the Department of Education's district-level teams and field support centers and, as, and at individual schools. Of particular note, representatives from the Department of Education met with 1,721 participants at 17 turning five kindergarten orientation, se orientation sessions held across the five boroughs this school year. 
These meetings are intended to support families of students with disabilities through their transition to, to kindergarten and included information about our ASD programs. The Division of Specialized Instruction and Student Support offers a wide range of professional learning opportunities through District 75 and the Special Education Office that are open to all special education teachers, related service providers, school administration, and paraprofessionals. Examples of professional learning topics offered are verbal behavior, designing effective classrooms for students with autism, teaching communication, and transition skills in, in the autism classroom. Through our partnerships with NYU, we provide workshops for educators and administrators in community schools on autism basics and strategies that work. We are proud of the robust professional learning and specialized program offerings that continue to expand, and we continually search for innovative ways to serve our students, especially in inclusive settings. This school year, we are partnering with NYU on a collaborative study group looking at current DOE practices in autism education within district schools. The group's goal is to make recommendation for models that better serve students on the autism spectrum in the district schools. Having conducted site, site visits and interviews with teachers, administrators, and families, the study group will, will formulate recommendations that will be aligned with the vision of the central office as well as the needs of, of educators and families who work with children every day. The group's recommendations expected in July will help inform the ongoing development of our programs for children with autism spectrum disorder. I would now like to turn to the proposed legislation. Intro number 1424 requires autism spectrum disorder reporting from the Department of Education. As part of the Department of Education's commitment to ensure that parents, advocates, elected officials, and other stakeholders have helpful information regarding special education, in 2015, we worked with the City Council to enact Local Law 27, which requires the DOE to submit a, co submit a comprehensive annual report. This report includes citywide data on the number of DOE students who have an IEP cl disability classification of autism. While we support the goal of the proposed legislation, we have concerns about singling out a specific disability as part of a report on student demographics. The proposed legislation seeks revi revisions to sections 21-957 and 21-958 of the New York City Administrative Code reporting on demographic data in the New York City public schools. These sections require reporting on broad categories of student demographic information. Intro number 1424, in contrast, seeks information about one disability, uh, one category of disability. As such, we believe that a different section of the administrative code would be, would be more appropriate for this type of reporting. Though the DOE would not be able to comply with the proposed legislation as written, we look forward to working with the council on revised language to reflect the addition additional demographic and district level data, inf district level information DOE is able to report to the council on students with IEP classification of autism. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to our continued partnership with the city council on this important work and we would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. A bunch of m number of my colleagues have questions and I just have a couple. I'm gonna just focus on uh, 1424 for a second and then I'll pass it around to my colleagues uh, <clears throat> but it, essentially from your testimony today it's I mean the answer is, is to how many children are uh, in uh, who, who have the uh, an ASD diagnosis uh, according to the DOE is 20,450 students right they have IEPs that indicate that they have the, autism, the educational classification of autism so that, all right, that information though is clear, is we now have, and is, all right, well that, that is I think uh, improvement and I'm uh, appreciative of getting that information. Um, I just have a, a couple, the, the num do you know the number of students, I'm sure you do, mm -hmm. who are not, who have uh, a autism diagnosis who are not able to be served by New York City Public Schools? We do. Do you know what that number is? Um, there are, are 48,000 students uh, attending um, non-public schools, and I apologize, 3,500 of them have the educational classification of autism. Uh, this, but you're, in other words, there, there, there's a parent who might send, choose to send their kid to a yeshiva, for instance, and then you supplement the services versus a student who is, the DOE is not able to serve in a DOE well, school. Yeah. 
Right. Uh, that breakout is not something we have right now, but we can get that to you. Uh, the number of kids who are have a recommendation from the DOE that the appropriate setting would be a non-public school that's approved to serve students with autism. Just, to, just so I, there are there are children who their parents might choose to send them to parochial school, who you th who if they chose to send them to a DOE school, you would be able to serve with supplement with the services available at the DOE. Right. Okay. That so you understand my question, and you'll provide additional when you have it. That yes. would be. That would be uh, uh, just on a couple of the. Um, uh, by, by the way, from, from just my, my rough math on my phone, which I ran for office because I didn't think there would be any math, but uh, <laughs> I came up with like 58.7 kids of the number of students served as having a IEP that says they have uh, that that they are on the spectrum, which is greater than. No, it's. Yeah. It's about 20,000 kids with uh, that classification out of uh, close to 200,000 kids in public schools with an IEP. So it's, it's more. No, but uh, out of the total number of students, 1.1, 1.2 so million. There, there are, um, we serve approximately 200,000 uh, students. And of, of those students. No, no, how many students do you serve in total? Yes, I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to okay. throw it. So we serve um, a, approximately 200,000 students with IEPs, and of those students, approximately 9% of them have the educational classification of autism. But my question is, how many students do you serve in total who don't have IEP and, and non-IEP oh, in the 1.1? 1 .1 it's, it's um, well, the, the most recent number that I looked at today is, is just under a million. It was just under a million. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what does anyone so that's not what I did um, I, I calculated at 1.1 or something like that but it, 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 it is within the ballpark of the national average uh, of 1 in 68 right mm -hmm. yes we could yeah. do the math yeah, somewhere we in the range math. of 2% yeah, <laughs> around there okay so it's in the ballpark of the national average. The, the rate of classification of the educational cl classification of autism is in the ballpark of the national ad average and using CDC's numbers. I mean, that, to me, that's profoundly important information to make sure that we're, yes. that, you know, we're, if we're consistent with the national average, that means in all likelihood we're doing a good job of identifying uh, children who need this, yeah. these services. So that's, uh, I think, also very helpful. Um, I have some questions about for health uh, regarding the service providers, but I think I'll save that till we go around once. And uh, okay, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Johnson and Council Member Brelli had some questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Chisholm. If you would just refer back to something you had said that um, about the community health survey. You had said that the uh, CHS does not always l have the power to yield reliable prevalence estimates at neighborhood level for diagnoses of low prevalence conditions. C can you explain that for a second? Sorry. What we're saying is that um, conditions that have a low prevalence in, you know, the population, such as according to the CDC, the um, autism spectrum disorder, when there's a low prevalence in the population, it, our surveys are really not designed to be sensitive in obtaining information about those kinds of conditions. I'm going to defer for further discussion to my colleague from My name is Amber Levinon Seligson, and I work in the Bureau of Epidemiology Services, and that's a very good description. When we design our surveys, we design them to represent particular geographic areas, the borough or what we call United Hospital Fund areas. So the Community Health Survey is designed to represent United Hospital Fund areas. There are 34 or sometimes 42 if we combine years of data. But when we have a health indicator that has a small percentage of the population that has that health indicator, it can be hard to have reliable estimates um, at those small geographic levels. So that is the challenge that we've been faced with. So uh, other conditions that CHS does track that have um, even lower, I mean, exponentially lower prevalence. How do you track? I, know, I noticed asthma was 36 out of 10,000, um, and infant mortality was 2.9, and I think out of I think 10,000 as well. Um, that's obviously far less than one out of 68. So, I mean, are you getting those numbers from actual reporting from hospitals? 
and that's why it's a precise number? So I'm not sure about infant mortality. Th those are different data that, that the Community Health Survey doesn't track. But we do, for things like asthma, um, and I'm not sure where the statistic comes from that you mentioned, but we do collect lots of data that we like to be able to get citywide prevalence estimates of or borough level estimates of. Um, but, but these small geographic areas, it can be hard for things like asthma or small prevalence health outcomes to collect neighborhood level estimates. What would, what would be a higher prevalence condition than something that's affecting one to two percent of the population? Well, for example, diabetes, um, that's an example of a higher prevalence, or um, we, we track... That, that was like 612 out of 100,000. That's still not... If I, I'll pull it up. Hold on. So I'm, I'm talking about the prevalence rates. Um, yeah. And so, you know, things like um, obesity and, and overweight, things where we have okay. between 16%, 30%. I'm sorry, I was looking at adult hospitalizations for diabetes. Yeah, so that's a different data source. Um, that was where maybe you got the asthma from. But, but is, is that because from the hospitals you were able to get precise data on the number of cases? So the, the Community Health Survey um, is a sample of the population, right? So we just take a, t a sample of the population and then it represents the population. The hospitalization data, that's a very different kind of data source um, where, yes, we could have from the New York State um, the universe of all the hospitalizations that happen in the state of New York or the, c the city of New York. Okay. Um, you... You mentioned that um, developing an accurate prevalence estimate would involve a robust surveillance system that requires substantial investment, uh, including staff, technical infrastructure, policy changes. Is that something that as an agency, given the, the prevalence that we do see or we do see from the CDC numbers, is that something that the agency would look favorably on? These bills that have been introduced have really raised a lot of questions for the department, and we are at a very high level having multiple discussions about what all would be involved in collecting such data. There is great interest in understanding what the investment would be and what the various areas of need might be in order to do so. So there are ongoing discussions presently thanks to your presenting these bills. Good. Um, you said the department would be happy to report to the council on uh, services based on EI. Um, I, I guess it would be called a diagnosis, but people who are have been evaluated for EI services and then have been granted EI services. Can you do you think you can get the precise number of those children? Yes, we can tell you the number of families who have come to the EI program and who are receiving services. I'm going to ask my colleague, Assistant Commissioner um, Marie, to come up to give a little bit more on that. But please understand that one of the things we want to emphasize is that the Early Intervention Program delivers voluntary services, which means right. that we're not speaking prevalence here. We are very happy to share with you both information about early intervention uh, services, the recipients of, as well as the other developmental disability services that the department um, supports. So the, the, the delta between the uh, number of people getting the services or qualified for the services and the, the likelihood of the number of people actually out there it is based on variables such as parental involvement, um, you know, uh, whether the kids showed signs at a particular age. But are those things that, as a, a health agency, uh, is that a gap that you think through engagement and policy you could shrink? So we are interested, as I said before, you know, your, your presentation of these bills has really brought a number of concerns to our attention. We're very interested in being able to be aware of who in New York needs what services. We do not currently have the ability to report on prevalence, however. We are very happy to share information about those individuals who have come to receive these voluntary services. You're right that there's a gap. And we can't really estimate what that gap looks like because we haven't a clue. There aren't any requirements to date that you know, require reporting. So we, we can't really speak mm -hmm. to that. We're very interested. We recognize our role in being aware of you know, what the needs for services are. And we're interested. We're having those conversations. I'd like you to listen to um, Dr. Casalino for just a moment regarding the early intervention program in particular. So um, as you know, I'm Marie Casalino. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Early Intervention in the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, so as my colleague uh, Janice Chisholm has mentioned, uh, we provide services to children on the autism spectrum disorder. 
And we know that in uh, 2016, uh, of the approximately 30,000 children that received services, there were just over 4,000 children uh, that had a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Uh, but again, uh, our program is voluntary, so we know about the children that have uh, been referred to the program with parental consent uh, and have gone through our process and have received services. But we can share with you the number of children by borough, by zip code, um, and as always, uh, we do our best to protect confidentiality based on the numbers we can provide. Okay, and I just have one final question that's the DOE about this. Um, you know, thinking with my politician hat on, as I'm sure some of my colleagues do, the impetus. <laughs> it's an election year, you should. <laughs> anyway. um, you know, I, I'm not ashamed to say that th this started from me looking into some, for, for some data in order to justify me making a call for more services, right? That's what we do. We see a statistic and we do a press conference saying we need more, we need more. Um, and you see the council taking actions, uh, as I mentioned earlier, everything from door locks to uh, Avante's law, all things based on ASD diagnoses. We're doing it sort of voluntarily, but you are faced with the children regardless of, of what we do and, and are, are essentially forced to confront the problem uh, when the child's uh, either four or in pre-K or five or in kindergarten. Do, do the students come to you, or, or rather, do you accept incoming classes uh, in different school districts essentially blind to how many kids will need services? So, so um in terms of uh, students attending their home zone school, I just want to be clear on, your, on, on the question. So, I mean, one of the things that we're really proud of is that we have more students with the educational classification of autism attending their home zone schools now more than ever. And particularly on Staten Island, we're seeing uh, more and more inclusive practices and, and very much um, complement the work that's going on there. Um, and so in terms of uh, resources and resource allocation, I think is where you're, where you're going right. with this question. As students, um, the funding follows the student and we create programs based on the needs. And so if a student is uh, s slotted to attend their home zone school and they have the educational classification of autism, um, then we look at the needs of the school and uh, work to make sure but, that- but The clock starts from an evaluation that you give the students in pre-K or kindergarten at some point? So. Um, uh, the early intervention, um, hands-off students, as um, was stated before, uh, to CPSE, which is the Committee on Preschool Special Education, um, as early as age three. Okay. And so, and then we work uh, on to create the, uh, into the IEP for the child at age three, and then certainly work with to place the child in, in an appropriate preschool program. So th the gap I mentioned before about Mm -hmm. Whether it be through parental involvement or sure. kids not showing signs, I mean, that's having the data that, that we're talking about with the bill could potentially help if it sort of bridged that, that divide, you know, uh, for, for a, a community district that maybe doesn't have as, as involved. Um, Parents with regard to the Department of Education and, and the bill and, and the data, we are more than willing to work with you on getting that uh, information by district as requested. And um, certainly- uh, I'm, try I'm trying to see if you would benefit from the, uh, the data I see. from earlier in the other bill, if that would be beneficial to you. Well, we, cl we work closely with early intervention in the Department of Health and making sure that that handoff is as seamless as possible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No, I won't be long. Thank you very much. It's nice to see all of you today. Ms. Foti, you may have the longest title in the city of New York, and I wonder if you can get that all on your business card. <laughs> um, I wonder who else, um, at the bottom of your first page of testimony, um, you said comprehensive evaluations conducted by the DOE along with teachers. Who else at the DOE is responsible for uh, making these evaluations? Uh, joining into the pool of evaluators. Um, do you mean in terms of the representation on the IEP team? Yes. Yeah, so so each IEP team that makes decisions for a child is comprised of, of certainly, first and foremost, the parent, um, at least uh, one general education teacher, one special education teacher, a school psychologist, a, so, a social worker, um, a district representative who's familiar with the IEP process, um, 
if necessary, a school physician if the child has medical needs that require that level of intervention. Um, and when old enough, the student, but certainly in, in younger years, um, that that is not always as appropriate. And I want to follow up on um, some of what uh, Councilman Borelli talked about. Do you have the same problems placing children in schools that uh, we all seem to have and that there just aren't enough seats? Do your children, I have a lot of District 75, I'm not upset with that. I have two whole schools, I have P4, mm -hmm. I have 811, I have 993, sure. I have 220, I go on and on. And many of those schools have, are, are within, sure. have programs in my district. I have PS23 as well, which has three locations in my district. Uh, and that's fine, um, you know, we, we work um, for that. But do you have the same issues that other schools have with overcrowding or um, has that not yet come your way? Um, well, for, at first you have many uh, District 75 schools that, to be very proud of and, that, and that's I am, wonderful. I am, and I give them a lot of money, you should know. Last year. <laughs> don't and tell them what I gave them this year because we haven't passed the budget yet. But <laughs> I'll let you deliver that message. Uh, but um, with regard to space, and certainly uh, New York City Public Schools are uh, consistently work with the Office of Space Planning and um, certainly the Chancellor is consistently advocating uh, for to meet the needs of, of our schools. And I think uh, the department does an excellent job of, of meeting that need. As we need additional classes and programs, we do open those classes and programs. Um, and uh, I can't speak, speak specifically to any particular space concerns you may have, but I'm happy to go back and, and look into. I don't really, I mean, I'd love to have more space, and I'm working on that with Ms. Grillo, but um, that's another topic for another day. The last question I have, uh, is there a limit on how far um, some of the students in my district, not necessarily District 75 students, I have students who attend high school in my district that come from the Rockaways, which is yeah. an inordinately long amount of sure. distance and time, especially on a New York City bus, not a school bus, but a regular bus, or two or three buses, and maybe a subway, on and on and on. Is there a limit in law on how far we can transport students who are special needs children? Well, before we speak to the law, I mean, just generally, of course, as a best practice, we would right. want to make sure that there's limited time travel. Certain students have very specialized uh, needs and as a result attend very specialized schools. Those programs are not always available in the home zone zoned district, um, as you mentioned earlier with regard to, to D75 programs. Um, but in terms of the... Uh, the legal aspect of things. Well, I think the. Uh, I'm not looking to write a law. <laughs> Trust me, maybe my counsel is, but I'm. I think there are uh, the Office of Pupil Transportation has uh, targeted limits on the amount of time a student should be on a bus, a, a school bus. Um, if there are any issues around a kid having to attend a school that's a great distance from home to get a specialized program. Um, those are situations in which we will look to open up a new class somewhere closer if possible. Occasionally, um, with very specific programs for small numbers of kids, it can be difficult to get a, a, the number of students you need to have a, a functioning class in a certain location. No, I, I understand that, and I, I, you know, I, it's not so bad, you know, as bad as traffic has become in Eastern Queens, it's not that, not like, uh, let's say middle of Brooklyn or, or Western Queens, um, so it's not too bad. But these kids also, many of them travel, have a lot of after school programs, they come to the Samuel Field Y, they, you know, there are um, all sorts of uh, after school programs as well for these young people. I would like all of your business cards if you have them though, so, because uh, you'll be a great resource to the students in my district, and I'll be, I'll be at 8, 11 in the morning, so we'll see how things are doing there as well. Thank you very much, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, just anecdotally, I will say I am had parents tell me where the IEP said that the kids shouldn't be on the bus for more than 45 minutes and you yeah. can't get them there in 45 minutes. So you change the IEP to say that the kid should be on the bus for an hour and that solves your problem, but that's not really <coughs> – the parents don't like it. I don't think that that's – Council Member Wills. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So I want to commend both the chair and uh, – the council member on the bills, I am signed on to one, and as an oversight, I'm not signed on to the other, which I'm doing today. Um, these bills are very important. My questions begin at some of the answers that I've gotten or we've heard that I don't think are acceptable 
Um, one of them, which was the last one, was the pupil transport with the hardship time that we just spoke about, and the chair followed up on that. Um, even if there's a, a, trans, a pupil transport hardship, there has to be an allowance or a greater uh, discernment for us when we're dealing with uh, children with these, these disorders. So I don't understand how we can give an answer that's such a blatant answer saying that the Office of Pupil Transportation or whatever office you cited, that's acceptable to say that those children that are mainline or mainstream be without any problems and the ones that are mainstream through IEPs or ASD should go on the same um, track. How is that acceptable? I didn't mean to suggest that there's the same level of transportation provided to kids with different disabilities. Um, so if you didn't mean to suggest it, then what is the answer when council, the council member just asked you about the time that a child with AS, uh, autism spectrum disorder, ASD, or uh, IEP can be transported on a bus? He just made a mention or illustration from Far Rockaway to his part of Queens. That's unacceptable. That's more than 45 minutes. It's more than an hour in some cases. So if you didn't mean to say it, then give us the correct answer or let me know if you will get it to us. The, the question I heard the councilman mention, uh, city buses. So there are different, uh, of course, uh, types of transportation provided from metro cards on up to small buses or even ambulances for certain students. Uh, we can get you the full details on the standards for what, tra what type of transportation is provided and the limits on school bus time, which mm -hmm. uh, vary according to uh, whether a student is in uh, attending a school within the borough or outside the borough. But certainly, um, this is an issue of great concern. We don't want to have kids on buses for long periods of time, and especially not kids who have autism spectrum disorder where that can be a real um, impediment to the student being able to arrive at school and prepared to learn. And uh, this is uh, something we pay a lot of attention to and, and have a lot of um, uh, important conversations with parents about. Okay. So in the testimony on page three, the last paragraph, it says, intro 1424 requires autism spectrum disorder reporting from the DOE as part of DOE's commitment to ensure that parents, advocates, elected officials, and other stakeholders have helpful information regarding special education in 2015 work with the city council to enact law 27 which requires the DOE to submit a, a comprehensive annual report. This report includes citywide data on the number of DOE students who have an IEP disability classification of autism. But then it says, while we support the goal of the proposed legislation, we have concerns about singling out a specific disability as part of a report on student demographics. The proposed legislation seeks revisions to sections 21957 and 21958. Um, what I don't understand is how can you, why is there a concern about singling out a specific disability when this particular disability has the prevalence that it has, especially when um, DOHMH has said that they actually support uh, the other bill, but I guess because of logistics, finances, and different things like that, you would want to have a larger conversation about this bill going into effect. May I interrupt you? Sure. I just want to make sure that I'm very clear. We are absolutely in support of the intention of the bill. I was what, talking about DOE. I know what right. you're saying. Right. So right. I just want to make no, sure. No, I, I said that specifically, right. We're, we're but you need, there's some right logistical there issues that we have to go over to make the bill more effective. They actually make the, the reporting to more effective. To make the bill viable, viable right. and feasible, yes. Understood. Okay, so that is very clear. But DOE is saying that they have actually concerns about doing it at all. Um, uh, no. singling, out, singling out a specific disability. You said, while we support the goal of the proposed legislation, that's nice, that's aspirational. But you said we have concerns about singling out a specific disability as part of a report. That means that specific bill that we have, you have concerns about doing it at all. Not, no. not about doing it at all. We, we want to provide data on autism, specific data that's been referred to. We're talking about the placement of it in, in a bill about um, student demographics generally and why we would put one disability there. We think it, it would make more sense to have this be a Give me an issue. illustration, please, of which portion you would have a, a concern about. So um, we, we are simply saying that we uh, would, if we're proposing to report on autism, we'd like to report on all 13 educational classifications. So we're not trying to uh, 
say that we're not going to or that we're, we're just saying that we don't want to single out one disability classification as um, over others when we have students across the city that we're serving with, with other educational classifications. And so we're just trying to highlight the importance of serving all, all students. Uh, Chair, I, I, I just want to mention, I think that they're accurately re representing that there are, I think, productive negotiations going on about getting to a place where they feel that they can. No, no, I, I understand that, but we can, we can do that and still have language that doesn't seem to, it seems to shift it later on. I don't like language that is, uh, well, I would consider arbitrary that doesn't actually lock in specific responsibilities or accountability measures. And this, and I, I take this a little, uh, really personal because I have family members that have been diagnosed with this. And what I'm seeing is um, just like other measures, we have good intentions, mm -hmm. but our intentions sometimes are lost in the sea of everything else we're trying to do to get towards it. Un understood. Okay. No, and, and certainly can very much appreciate your, your the personal aspect of this. And and very much to, to that point, we want to make sure that in, in addition to our students with autism, we're saying that if we're going to um, highlight the importance of this, let's do this for all educational classifications. Okay. The um, Two more questions, Mr. Chair. Uh, with the financial resources that the city gives to parents um, that have uh, children diagnosed with ASD, um, <coughs> how does vouchers play into that? Because if a child is not able or doesn't fit into the community-based um, approach or the schools or daycares that they go to, um, how does vouchers play into that? Because honestly, um, in my district and districts that look like mine across the city, and I'm not talking about districts of color that have English as a second language. I'm talking about districts of color, period. There's not a lot of promotion to these problems. But uh, communities of color, the diagnosis rate has gone up over the last six years tremendously. But I don't see the same level of promotion to tell people, hey, we're out here, we can help you, these are the resources. So in addition to telling me what the promotion plan is, what uh, what does the voucher um, work out for that? Are there vouchers available for people with the with these um, diagnoses? So by promotion, do you mean, um, I think you mean Same thing community like did, engagement? Yeah, we did UPK for all, right? That's everywhere, mm -hmm. every day. Um, but a lot of the people are coming up, voucher, I mean, a lot of the people are coming up by getting these diagnoses and really don't know what to do. And now we're talking about 3K for all. Sure. So they would have these diagnoses even earlier before they engage with the city. Sure. So how, what is the promotion plan for that? Sure. Well, s well certainly we have a close eye on um, the, the needs as they develop uh, and are certainly trying to be as proactive as possible in planning as early as um, with regard to our three-year-olds, uh, just as much we're, as we're planning uh, for our students in, uh, in upper grades. Um, with regard to family and community, en and, and community engagement, uh, we, we certainly take those partnerships uh, very seriously and are um, like to consider ourselves active members of, of uh, in, in terms of our relationship with community-based organizations, et cetera. Um, with regard to our specialized programs, um, I had mentioned in my, in my testimony earlier, and it's just worth noting, that um, we are very committed to uh, uh, ensuring that students transition seamlessly and succe successfully uh, at each point of their educational careers. And um, one of those those transitions is a transition to, to kindergarten. And um, and certainly we want uh, that to be a successful th the transition that um, for, for all parents and students, but certainly the, those of uh, students with disabilities. And in our most recent um, orientation se sessions, we specifically included uh, information and on our specialized programs it, w it, with the hope of making sure that we are catch catching every group and making sure that everybody knows that these programs exist and that there is access for all in terms of um, the specialized programs and meeting the needs of, of students with autism. So can I just suggest that with that you push further into the city funded daycares. Um, a lot of them, a lot of parents do not know this and there are parents with children that are five and six and children that are two and three that are coming right behind them mm -hmm. that may be, have a diagnosis or maybe getting a diagnosis mm -hmm. and they really don't know if they can go to these centers or if these centers are adequately equipped for this or if the CBOs, because there's not 
a huge contract um, now, but if the CBOs are even culturally suitable, have culturally suitable constructs for these communities. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your bill and Councilmember Borelli's bill. And thank you, panel. I know I asked rapid fire questions, but he the members want to ask questions also. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Could I just go back to my my math uh, question? <laughs> because now that if we revise the now, if there are a million kids in public schools, and twenty thousand four hundred fifty of them have IEPs that say uh, spectrum disorder, I get forty nine one in one in forty nine. Is that what? Which is higher than uh, one in sixty eight. <laughs> It, it, that's that's your math. I think is right. And there you go. Uh, <laughs> I'm a product of New York City Public Schools. <laughs> it's all working. Just one note on the the CDC uh, information they surveyed. I think was 11 states. Um, the most, the closest of which was New Jersey, and I think the rate there is similar to that. Somewhere around one in one in 40 was what they came up with in New Jersey. So. Uh, it, it wouldn't be a surprise to find that that the rate was uh, was closer to one in fifty than uh, than one in sixty eight. Do, do you think that there are uh, factors about the the system, so to speak? Like, I don't know how you know what you know in terms of comparing the public school population to the private school population. I don't know you know if it's more prevalent or less prevalent. Or um, so, do you think that the that you might have a higher percentage of kids uh, with ASD than all New York City kids going to school? I, I don't think we could make a, a guess at that. Uh, the data that we have is, is the number of kids with that classification on IEP. Uh, for some reasons, uh, that might include more or fewer kids than, um, or a higher rate or lower rate than if you were to uh, be able to get an estimate of all children. Uh, that's sort of a place, though, where there's sort of a, an interagency. Uh, you know, there's there's the number of kids in the DOE system, and then there's a number of kids in total going to school in New York City. And you know, it, DOE could be uh, shouldering uh, a larger responsibility. It, all, but it, it, it's not clear to me what's going on in, in the city as a whole. If you know, we only have this. Obviously, a very big slice, but it's not it's not the whole pie, in terms of what's going on with kids in New York City and ASD. It's of some concern to me. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, programs uh, from DOHMH that you contract with, um, do do you know how many of those are uh, th the product of RFPs versus uh, discretionary programs? Yes, you may recall the RFP that we issued last year. Um, there are 20 programs through the RFP. So, so then 50 programs are, are council discretionary? Um, there are some, and there is some overlap, because some of the programs in the RFP are also receiving yeah. support services from the council. Could you talk about, uh, you, you said that you make them avail the programming available in languages. Do you have any languages you actually do make programming available in? We can get that information to you. Uh, I would. Okay. Uh, I would be interested in that. I'd be interested to know the number of people that the service providers identify as multilingual or mm -hmm. bilingual. You know. Uh, also, I think following up on uh, on your testimony, and I, I guess it was a point Councilmember Borelli made um, in terms of the state uh, identifying what what pediatricians, I guess, in this case, are reporting and not reporting. Uh, could you, by regulation, put a note, like, ask, require by regulation every physician in the city to report to you on a diagnosis of uh, ASD? As noted previously, we are having those conversations at present. We are very interested in understanding what it is we don't know and being better able to understand what we should. So those conversations are ongoing presently. What I can tell you is that there is no municipality currently that is making that requirement, though we are aware that there are some several states that have actually determined the need for state-required registry. But you believe you have the authority to do it on, on a municipal level? We're reviewing our okay. responsibility. All right. Uh, because, again, I, I think, you know, regardless of what the state does, I think that the information is profoundly important, and the population in New York City, you know, 
if I had to guess, you know, the most vulnerable populations are getting underdiagnosed. Um, so it, it would be really, I think, of tremendous benefit for us to have a good handle on on who in New York City is uh, <coughs> are, are really getting, you know, who need these services, who are being diagnosed, being underdiagnosed. Um, I'm just going to run through a couple of the actual. Uh, let's see if I've covered. Excuse me, one second here. We've done good. Okay. All right. I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank and you for the opportunity to testify. Excellent. Okay. Um, next up is Alicia Berry from Ramapo for Children. Check, check. Sorry about that. <laughs> We're ready. No worries. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Hello, my name is Alicia Berry, and I am the Associate Director of Parent Education and Support at Ramapo for Children. Um, and I, again, want to start by thanking you, the City Council, for your longstanding commitment to supporting parents and caregivers of children with autism spectrum disorder. Ramapo for Children is a New York City-based agency with an extraordinary track record of serving children and adults who work with them since 1922 through direct service youth programs and highly regarded training programs for adults. Ramapo works on the behalf of children who face obstacles to learning, including children of all abilities, enabling them to succeed in the classroom, at home, and in life. We do this by providing workshops and assistance to educators, youth workers, and parents to help them better meet the needs of their children. In addition to collecting data related to the diagnosis of individuals, we must continue to provide access to parent education and support. We have been a parent education and support provider for the New York City Council Autism Awareness Initiative for the past eight years. Ramapo's workshops serve over 3,000 families impacted with ASD. All parents and caregivers who have participated in Ramapo's behavior management workshops have reported that the training helped them feel less alone as caregivers of children with autism spectrum disorders and provided them with techniques and tools they could use immediately to help their child. In the words of one parent, you were able to help me understand my son more in this one workshop than in the last four years of raising him. It was a struggle, but you made it easier. For parents and caregivers, our workshops are the only opportunities they have to receive vital skills to meet the unique needs of their children and make daily life less stressful. One parent, work, 
Our parent workshops are relevant, substantial, and they provide information that is relatable. Too frequently, parents have little access to information and support to help their children. Parent education and support is a low-cost, high-impact, efficient way to ensure these New Yorkers have access to assistance. Ramapo is an itinerant service provider, targets underserved areas, and travels to all five boroughs, working with families for whom this is often their first access point to support on how to manage the challenges of raising a child with a disability. We respond to racial, socioeconomic, multi-generational, and cultural diversity of New York City. Our workshops have served working parents, grandparents, immigrant populations, Russian, Latino, Chinese, from Mont Haven to Staten Island to Benchlinhurst, just to name a few. We partner with hospitals, community centers, and public schools. Each year, we identify new groups of New Yorkers who are parenting children with disabilities and set up workshops to bring information and support to their neighborhoods. While our programs have allowed us to reach many diverse parent populations, there are communities who still await help and need it desperately. In addition, each day there are new parents who receive a diagnosis of AS ASD for their young children. These parents need immediate help to understand this diagnosis and quickly learn skills to utilize, oh, sorry, learn skills and utilize tools to support their children. We are hopeful that you will understand how much the support provided through parent education means to families who are impacted by ASD. I thank the New York City Council for their time and support today. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge we've been joined by Council Member Crowley. Um, I, I, one of the things that, that I'll just take a moment to uh, pat the council on its back, um, <laughs> I'm particularly proud of the fact that the uh, autism initiative umbrella goes to provide sort of wraparound comprehensive services uh, for, you know, for the family, for caregivers, um, uh, educational support services, more than uh, I think than uh, the agency is able to or is mm -hmm. chosen to through through the RFP. So. Mm -hmm. I, I think it makes sense that you know autism. You know, while obviously you know the individual child has it, it really impacts the entire family, and sometimes you know um, you know community uh, implications as well. So uh, I just want to say that I am uh, uh, proud of the way that we allocate uh, in autism. You talked about in your group uh, in that your organization, um, uh, you, you know. Uh, with the Russian community, Latino, Chinese, do you know though? Uh, is there a uh, a demographic that you think that you've you think that you particularly serve more of? Um, do you think that mm -hmm. that New York City as a whole is serving all the communities that need to be served? Or do you think mm -hmm. there's under uh, suspect that there's underserved communities? So I would say the largest uh, communities that we are serving right now um, with this specific source of funding um, are Spanish-speaking families um, within the Bronx. Um, that is where we allocate um, most of our resources currently. Um, we're pushing into working with parents and caregivers um, within the Asian communities. Um, we're starting to build relationships with um, the schools, or community-based organizations they attend. Um, and this year we did also pilot some work to particularly um, support parents and caregivers of children who are preschool aged. Um, and we had a very large um, amount of response to that. Um, we did about two four-part series um, and each one was packed um, with families and we're actually doing a third series right now um, to serve those families who were initially waitlisted. Uh, can you talk a little bit just to how families come into contact with your agency? Is mm -hmm. it, uh, are people seeking you out? Are you seeking them out? Um, so it is a mixture. Primarily, we um, are an itinerant service provider, so we partner directly with schools, community-based organizations, or hospitals um, who reach out to us. Uh, the variety, most of our business is through word of mouth. Um, folks will hear from a provider that we've worked with that it was very successful and they loved us, um, and then they will reach out. 
we do get also some individual families who have gone to a workshop at another community um, and are a parent themselves or work at a hospital or a community-based organization and want to bring us in to support their community as well. So, so but essentially you're um – it's incumbent upon either the school or, or the other institution sort of to act as a, a middle person to try to... S yes, yes. Uh, I think that this is probably, you know, since I'm not a scientist and mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, it's just my, uh, my own hunch, but uh, I, I think that it is clear that the rise in the diagnosis mm -hmm. is just uh, as a society doing a better job of getting the word out so that... Mm -hmm. You know, that you don't have to be, you know, super affluent to mm -hmm. figure out that, that there's a problem here that needs that we need to look into. And I think that that is sort of making its way through mm -hmm. through society as a whole, trying to get the word out. Because it's heartening to me that you're yeah. saying that you're doing, you know, you know obviously I, I'm Bronx biased, mm -hmm. but I suspect that there's a tremendous need in the Bronx yes. for families that, you know, don't know – you know, don't know what autism is so mm -hmm. if you don't know what autism is it would be hard to to figure say, out where hey, to look go. you know that not only there's autism but it, that's mm -hmm. my kid like it would be hard I think for it would, it would be very very challenging for parents mm -hmm. to, to, to seek help if they don't know what they're seeking help for yes so I appreciate that uh, Councilmember Carl, do you have any questions no I don't okay awesome. I appreciate your testimony thank you so much guys thank you all right there's no one else testifying we're calling this committee a wrap. <laughs>